on the grid and ready to roll. And that is one of the most popular sights here right now. Mighty Mick Doohan flew his chopper down for this event here, the Clips Hill 500, and has just been receiving the accolades of the crowd as they get set for race one here. 250 kilometres, 200 points. Here are your commentators, Matthew White and Mark Osler. Good on you, Billy. Thank you very much. The build-up has been enormous. This battle will be both exciting and exhausting. 32 degree heat today. It'll be around about 55 degrees plus inside the cockpit of these cars at the moment. The drivers are relaxed, but they are ready to rumble. We'll have 36 cars starting this Clipsal 500 for 2002. Let's take a look at our drivers. And as they stand on the grid, Mark Scaife and Jason Brighter, Holden Racing Team 1-2 on the front row of the grid. Marcus Ambrose in the Pertec Racing Ford third. Garth Tander will start from position number four. Quite incredible. That pole time, some three seconds faster than last year. Max Wilson, what a brilliant effort by the Brazilian. He's fifth alongside Russell Engel. John Bauer, good effort that in the Aussie male forward. And Craig Lowndes back at eight. Nine and ten belong to Larry Perkins and Simon Wills. Stephen Johnson in the Shell Helix Ford in 11. And Stephen Richards in 12. Todd Kelly and Mark Larkham, they made the top 15. So did Greg Murphy. Stephen Ellery, though, got bumped. He's back in 16. Tony Longhurst has made a switch over to Team Better Electrical. He's in 17. Glenn Seaton, Barguana and Neil Crompton in the double zero motorsport Ford. Craig Baird driving the Team Brock Commodore under the Rod Nash stable for the first time. Rick Kelly, Wayne Gardner and David Bernard the two Caltex Haviland Fords. Down the back of the field, you've got Team Kiwi Racing. Paul Romano in 26, then John Faulkner and Cameron McLean, the VIP Pet Foods racer. Paul Morris in the Cirame Racing Commodore. Anthony Trout alongside in the Toll Express Ford. Rodney Forbes and Paul Wheel in the K&J Thermal Car. 33, 34, 35 and down to 36 is Paul Radisic. He will start from the back of the grid. An amazing story. They've pieced together the Shell Helix Racing Ford Falcon XR8 in an overnight exhaustive effort. $65,000 spent on rebuilding the car. Quite incredible. We will have 23 in-car cameras spread across seven cars. Greg Murphy in the Kmart racer has four cars and that's probably one of the best rides you'll ever see, especially through that particularly fast Dunlop sweeper. Paul Radisic and the Shell Helix racer. Car number 18 will be on board with him. As I said, an amazing story. They've already pieced this car back together. The super cheap auto entry of Stephen Ellery also carries three in-car cameras, a Ford 360 degree pan. You'll see out the back of the super cheap car and we'll keep our eyes on Stephen Ellery, the driver as well. Marcus Ambrose did an outstanding job in qualifying yesterday in the Pertec Ford. Watch him go today. He's right behind those two Holton Racing Team Commodores and he was the outstanding performer. V8 Rookie of the Year last year in V8's Dunlop on in-car camera with Russell Engel and the Castrol Perkins race team. Three cars now coming out of the Perkins stable, all beautifully prepared, and Russell very confident about the race today. As I mentioned, 23 cameras inside seven cars. We've got every angle covered. You'll be able to keep your eyes on the four-time series champion, Mark Scaife and the Holden Racing Team, the CUB. Camera, cameras inside that car. We've got three inside Mark's car, and we'll also take a look at the rear of his car as well. But he is the man on pole position for this race. 36 cars on the grid. You've got team and driver changes in the off-season. You've got a brand new control tyre of Dunlop. There's so many unknowns to lay ahead of us, not to mention 250 kilometres of absolute torture. And we can't forget the double zero motorsport Ford Falcon. Four cameras on board with Craig Lowndes. That will be an exciting ride. Air temperature at the moment is 27 degrees. We're expecting it to get hotter than that. They have forecast 32 degrees ambient temperature today. Track temperature is up to 38 degrees. So it's going to be a real sauna inside those cars. Expect cabin temperatures exceeding 50 degrees centigrade. What a workout. 250 Ks, all those exhaust fumes. Let's check out the Ford race analysis. It's the streets of Adelaide, of course, in beautiful South Australia. 36 starters on the grid, 78 laps the distance for each one of these 250 kilometre races or just over 250. 50 k's as you can see there the pit window opens on lap two closes on 57 and between those times they have to get both their compulsory tire change and their compulsory fuel stop made and of course jason bright is the reigning champion and look how strong he's looking in 2002 alongside his teammate mark scape this should be a ripper
Scaife has pole position. Then, of course, alongside him is Jason Bright. Marcus Ambrose and Garth Tander behind them. Max Wilson, the rookie Brazilian in the V8 Supercar Championship Series for 2002, starts from position number five. And look on the bottom right-hand side of your screen there. That is the Shell Helix car of Paul Radisic, way back in position number 36. So he has secured himself a spot on the grid. That's a terrific story. He had to go to hospital for precautionary x-rays after a major shunt into the Dunlop sweeper. So here we go. 36 cars on the grid, 78 laps ahead, 250 kilometer torture test. It is on the V8 Supercar Championship for 2002 and the Clipsal 500 are underway and Jason Bright has snuck in front of Mark Scaife into the centre chicane, so Bright gets the skip on his teammate. Hopefully this field can get through these first chicanes clearly. Yeah, it looks OK further back there. Look at this battle, though, between the Holden Racing Team Commodores. Jason Bright got the jump on the pole man. Mark Scaife, Garth Tander, brilliant start from the second row to muscle his way up into third. He's got Marcus Ambrose filling his mirrors, and look at this gaggle of cars. Lap one of 78, Bright gets the sneak on Scaife. Garth Tander slots in, in behind them. Now the back of the pack follows. The freight train is underway. They've got a hell of a long way to go. First time down to Bartels Road. You're looking at one of the fastest, if not the fastest spots on the circuit. Up to 240 kilometres per hour into this Dunlop sweeper. You'll hear heaps about this throughout the afternoon. They're clocking six gear around 220 to 30 kilometres per hour. One of the fastest corners in any race circuit around the country. Scaife here tries to go for the switch back on his teammate. He took a different line out of the hairpin. Didn't work though. Jason Bright covered his territory. They punch out of here, out of the forward turn, back toward the Mistral hairpin for the first time. It's an HRT 1-2. Garth Tander though, looking very competitive in 2002 in the Valvoline Cummins machine. Look at Marcus Ambrose in the Pertec Ford right up behind Tander and the first of the Castrol Commodores. So as they come across to complete lap one of 78, it's Jason Bright leads out the way. Then you've got Mark Scaife, Tander, Ambrose, Engel, Max Wilson has dropped one position. He's in sixth. Craig Lowndes in seventh. Bow eighth. Simon Wills in ninth. And Stephen Johnson rounds out the top ten. 77 laps to go. Very fast standing start. A 131.28 for Jason Bright. The fastest lap on that first one around. Race record is a 125.83, but that was before the Dunlop sweeper was added. Expect the lap record to tumble this afternoon. Robbie Starr has been on the radio to Mark Scaife already, just reminding him to breathe, just take it nice and easy. What he said was, try not to get tangled up with Bridey, just race your own race. And at the end of the day, pull clear on the guys behind you. It's an amazing thing, isn't it, that they've got to remind the four-time series champion, the best driver in the field at the moment, to breathe. Breathe, they tell him. They also leave a message for Jason Bright, right smack bang in the middle of his steering wheel, HRT, and it says, Jason, speak up. He's a notorious low talker, I guess you could say, and they ask him to speak up back on the talkback radio. So they come around now through turns 10, 11, and back onto 12. That's the forward corner. It brings you back around to the bottom of this race circuit. Take a look at the start. Bright on the right-hand side of the screen got the power down first and got the jump on Mark Scaife. It was a bit of a duel up the main straight, then into the first left-hander. They all squeeze into single file. If anything's going to happen, it'll happen right there first up. But thankfully, all 36 cars got through and Bright leads the way at best time, a 124.941. Boy, there's some uh, questions to be answered here. That's the first flying lap, and they're already under the old lap record. 124.94. Expect that to tumble even more as this fuel load comes down. And the cars and drivers really get in the groove. They get their suspension set up the way they want it. Drivers in these early laps with a full tank of fuel. we are adjusting their anti-roll bars, their brake bias, just trying to tune the car as they drive around to get it so it's producing maximum lap times. This is a shot on board the Pertec Ford. Marcus Ambrose in fourth place. He's got Russell Engel right up behind his bumper bar. He's trying to get in front of Garth Tander. This is absorbing stuff. Watch the speed here as they flash through the Dunlop sweeper. Sixth gear, a little brush of the brakes to steady the car. And look at that. Just get fired out the other side like a bullet out of a gun. Extraordinary speed they're pulling through here. Now heavy onto the brakes and Engel makes a move on Marcus Ambrose and gets through on the inside. So then it's Tanner, Ingle, and Ambrose slips back. Oh, this is heartbreaking. Paul Radisic, lap three, he's already pulled out. That is heartbreaking. The smoke pouring out from under that bonnet. Marshals are under it pretty quickly. And it's always a risk. Not quite sure what's put that car out, but it's always difficult when a crew is trying to put the car, the car together in a very, very short period of time. There's always the risk that something's been missed or 
Something may have broken as a result of the crash. It's a, it's a tough order. The team trying to have a chat to Paul Radisic. He can't seem to hear them, so there's all sorts of problems inside. DJR Shell Helix Racing Ford Can Falcon. Can you hear me, Paul? That's shattering because Paul Radisic had to fight tooth and nail to get back onto the starting grid for the start of this race. He made it there with the help of his teamwork, with the help of smash repairers in the middle of Adelaide City, with an outlay of around $65,000, a trip to the hospital, and poor old Paul Radisic is out for the moment. Here we go. Let's have a look at what happened here. Well, this is the Lansvale car just getting out of the way. Looks like he's had a may have blown an engine because the cars that were just coming around there before we went to that replay were skating and skidding all off the track. So I think Paul's dropped a lot of slippery fluid there. Oh, we've got a problem here now. Wayne Gardner and Simon Wills in trouble. Looks as though it's up the top of Bartels Road. It is. Yep. That's the right-hand turn. And there seems to be a lot of trouble on the Simon Wills Cat Ford. Well, so much so that he's lost the front door. I suspect that's a result of whatever Paul Radisic dropped on the road because a lot of cars were skating off there. It's maybe caught these two out as well. Look at the damage here. Simon Wills and the Caterpillar Ford. Wayne Gardner he has got a tyre cutting itself to pieces back there. Smoke pouring out the back of the Caltex Haveline Dark Dog Stone Brothers car. Wayne Gardner had to go through pre-qualifying to get here. The 1987 500cc world champion is going to contest selected rounds in the V8 Supercar Championship this year. And will also go in the Enduros. There's all sorts of pieces well, hanging out the bottom of that car. I think he's broken the uh, rear suspension too. Looks like that axle is moving laterally, wobbling side to side. So he's done a lot of damage to the back of that car. It's going to be a long visit to the pits for Wayne Gardner. And that is a brand new car for the Stone Brothers Racing Team too. So Wayne Gardner unveiling a brand new one here on the streets of the Clipsal 500. Look what's happened here. Lowndes has jumped Marcus Ambrose. Now he's right up behind Russell Engel. Lap record to Jason Wright. We expected that a 124.28 for the Holden Racing Team driver, but Craig Lowndes is the man on the move at the moment. Wright leads him. Scaife is second. Garth Tander is third. Ingle and Lowndes are in that battle for fourth and fifth. Marcus Ambrose into sixth. Mac Wil Max Wilson in seventh. Murphy eighth. Stephen Richards and Stephen Johnson nine and ten. Just standing by here for Simon Wills to bring the cat forward in. A lot of damage down the driver's side. Obviously, John Bow's car has also been brought in stuck in fourth gear and the Aussie male Ford has been pushed back into the garage. Gardner's uh, car's just come into the pits into the Stone Brothers pit. Wayne's getting out of it. He has a right load of damage on the back of it and uh, I would say it's I very much doubt whether it'll be coming back into the race because uh, the rear left hand tyre is squashed by all the bodywork and that so I'd say that's goodbye to Wayne Gardner. Well at least for today anyway. The casualties are already starting to crumble. Wayne Gardner looks as though he's gone. There is severe panel damage and structural damage to the car, the cat racing car of Simon Wills. Not sure if he's going to be able to start again. He's still sitting inside the cockpit as we take a look at your PlayStation race score. Bright, Scaife and Tanda, Ingle, Lowndes, Ambrose, Wilson, Murphy, Richards, Johnson, Perkins, Todd Kelly up in a 12th position. You're looking out the back of Russell Ingle's car and this is a great battle between the Castrol Perkins Commodore and the Double Zero Motorsport Ford Falcon of the Saturday Specialist here at Clipsal. Craig Lowndes has won every Saturday race held at the Clipsal 500. 99, 2000 and 2001. He hasn't missed a beat on the first day of competition. The word from the Cat Ford team is it's over. Simon Wills is getting out of the car. We'll have a word to him here and try and find out what's... Uh, just, just talk us through what happened, Simon. Uh, yeah, just uh, I think there was some oil down or something. I just uh, got a bit of a run on Max, but I was blinded to the flag point and just lost it on the oil. Then I saw a whole lot of cars coming towards me and unfortunately Wayne Gardner clicked at me on the oil. So nobody's fault, just unfortunately. Hard luck. Thanks. Let's count the cost at the moment. Simon Wills gone. Wayne Gardner gone. Paul Radisic more than likely gone. So three drivers out of 36 and three cars out of 36 are getting some pretty big attention overnight. Lap 7 of 78 in the Clipsal 500 of 2002. Jason Bright, a 124.000. He is on fire. Yeah, what happened there, Wayne? It's a bit of a bad luck story. Yeah, um, I don't really know. Uh, yeah, Simon Wills had spun out there, and uh, as I turned in, the rear just let go, whether I got a 
a tap at the rear or there was some oil or something, but the car just turned around and obviously uh, yeah, ran into, uh, into uh, Wills just trying to get back onto the track. Um, I don't know, a bit of a mystifying thing to me. Um, Short lived race, it's a shame because it wasn't too bad, the car was coming through the field. Well, they should be out tomorrow. Yeah, I think so. It's not terminal, but uh, it's just disappointing. Um, the, uh, you know, to be in Sydney, I'd rather be out there playing with the rest of them. Right on. Uh, it happens like that. Just down here at the uh, Aussie Mail Pit. I'm not sure if you can see this at the moment. Hopefully you can. Two guys have gotten inside the car with John Bow. They are working on the gear shifter or selector. They're having real trouble getting it out of fourth. It's stuck in fourth at the moment. John Bow pretty frustrated in the Triple Eight Aussie Mail Ford. Oh, that's a uh, shocking start to the weekend for the Aussie Mail Racing Team. They've expanded this year. John Bow has come along to join alongside his good mate Bradley Jones. And poor old Brad Jones had all sorts of dramas in qualifying yesterday. The car simply stopped on him in the middle of the main straight. By the time they got it back, Brad Jones was the one who had to climb under and see if he could fix it with his own hands, which he did. Then they've had more problems since then. So. The Aussie Mail Racing Team, they're looking forward to a big 2002, one of the expansion teams this season. Not off to a good start. It can be crucial. It will be crucial if they leave here without any points. And remember the change to the championship points. It goes all the way down to 32nd, but you have to finish a race to get the points. You must finish each race to collect points in each round. Your PlayStation race score looks like that. Bright Scape and Tanda, one, two, and three. Four, five, and six was Ingle, Lowndes, and Ambrose. And then all the way down to 10th, Stephen Johnson, 15 seconds back. On board we go and take a look at Greg Murphy. You might notice just in that shot before that he looks a bit like something out of Star Wars. That's all the cooling equipment that these guys have added. He's got some cooling equipment coming straight oh. onto his face and Lowndes and Ingle get tied up. Ambrose steers clear of it, but the positions haven't changed. Lowndes clearly wants to get on with it. He knows he can operate. He can operate much faster than Ingle if he can get out in clean air. And the Castrol Commodore is proving a very, very wide vehicle to pass. Look at Lowndes, he's climbing all over him. This has allowed not only Ambrose to join onto the back of this battle, but he's also got Greg Murphy now climbing on. So Ingle is holding it up and starting to get a bit of a train behind here. And Lowndes know he's got to get a move on. The other thing, the Gibson, the Gibson Motorsport, the Double Zero Motorsport team will be watching his engine temperature. Lowndes has been tucked up behind that Castrol Commodore lap after lap. That can play havoc with engine temperatures. Yet another go down the inside. Can he get in this time? They're side by side on the hairpin. Lowndes has got good track position. Now Ambrose wants to take advantage. He's got to go side by side up toward the fourth turn. Can he make a move as well? No. Through turns 11 and 12 now. So Craig Lowndes has finally won that scrap for fourth position. He moves up into fourth. Ingle is fifth. Ambrose is charging hard in sixth. And tagged alongside the back of that little freight train is Greg Murphy in the Kmart Racer. Jason Bright a 124.3. Scafe a 124.5. HRT. Tanders a 25-7, a 27 for Lowndes. That was the as a result of getting past Ingle. But it's going to be interesting now that Lowndes is in clean air to see whether he can close the gap to Garth Tander. Tander's about 11 seconds up the road from Lowndes now, so we'll watch that gap with interest. Craig Lowndes is making a move for his 50th race win. He's won 49 races since he's been behind the wheel and electrified crowds and television audiences right around the country. In this field, we've talked about Max Wilson, the Brazilian. Oh, take a look at this move on Russell Ingle. He was all over him like a rash throughout the first 17 laps, and finally Ingle relented, but Ambrose couldn't get the sneak through, and Ingle was saved by that next left-hander where he shut the door on Marcus Ambrose. So he had one Ford right behind him. Now he's got another Russell Ingle, and he's going to have to fight off that challenge as well. I mentioned 1997. When Craig Lowndes went across overseas, he raced Formula 3000. One man who he took on throughout that series was Max Wilson, the Brazilian. Wilson ended up in V8 supercars alongside <laughs> Lowndes here in 2002. Oh, Car number three. Cameron McConville. What a shame for the Lansvale racing team. It's been a difficult weekend for them, yeah. haven't it? hasn't it? Because uh, Trevor Ashby was hoping to run car number 23, but couldn't because of sponsorship troubles. Cameron McConville, for the moment, has had to park it at the Clipsall 500. Let's take a look at the race order as they cross the start and finish line. Bright and Scaife are still way ahead. Tanda and Lowndes go third and fourth. Ingle, Ambrose, Greg Murphy up to seventh. Max Wilson eighth. Stephen Richards in the Caltex Commodore is ninth. And Stephen Johnson remains in tenth position. Well, David Bernard, it's interesting. I was just talking to the team and they were saying the car's been running really, really hot. He's been short shifting. 
over the last sort of five or six laps trying to keep the temperature down. He's brought the temperature down and now he's having a go. So they're, they're worried about the temperature in the car. Just on the, the issue of dramas there, we saw Cameron McConville parked on the roadside. Steve Reed from the Lansdale Smash team tells me it's some sort of engine drama and it looks like that's the end of the day for Cam McConville. Yeah, what a shame. They uh, brought on some new sponsorship this year, had a big launch in Sydney a few weeks back. Very excited about the season, but that's not the way they wanted to go. Look at this attack by Ambrose under brakes. Greg Murphy now has a sniff of that. He, oh, just gets a little little love tap on the back of the Castrol Commodore. Ingle is struggling for race speed here quite clearly. Traffic's starting to get queued up behind him, and they've got to find their way past. So there's more speed out there. And Russell Ingle can deliver at the moment. Jason Bright and Mark Scape still in the mid-24s. And Lowndes, his first clear lap, he got to the mid-25s. Look at this. Murphy. Down the inside. Passes him with ease at the Mistral hairpin in the end after yet again another dogfight. And you can hear the teams telling their drivers to have a drink. Cooling is a major issue, as we said, around 50 degrees plus, if not 60, inside the cockpit. Think about doing that for two hours, not to mention trying to tame one of these five-litre V8 supercar beasts around one of the toughest circuits in Australian racing. So Greg Murphy moves up uh, in front of Russell Ingle. He finished second in the championship overall last year, Russell Ingle, and also finished second here on the streets of Adelaide last season. Not surprisingly, he doesn't want to finish second anymore. He wants to get yeah. up to the front of the bus, please. See the Holden Racing team's looking ominous at this early stage. The lead now over Garth Tander is 13 and a half seconds. He's been watching this timing monitor there consistently, a second a lap faster than the Valvoline Cummins Commodore. First lap in clear air, Lowndes dropped into the 26s, but there's no one out there at the moment that is matching the race pace of those two HRT cars. There's all sorts of subplots un uh, in, un un uh, <laughs> Unfolding here, yeah. unfolding here on lap 19. You've got the Holden versus Ford challenge. Ford have made it quite clear after the Holden domination of last year that Ford, somebody has to step up. And at the moment, take a look at what we just saw there with Lowndes and also Ambrose putting pressure on the Castrol Commodore of Russell Ingle. They've certainly got the pace. Have they got the race package to do it again? Coming up to traffic now. Further back in the pack, there's Larry Perkins just in front of Neil Crompton in the second the double zero motorsport cars brand new car making its debut this weekend Hilton hasn't quite found the sweet spot for this car it's not quite working the way he wants it but it's early days and he's got a long way ahead of him if he just concentrates hauling in as many points as he can he could end up in a good position this track this race is always forces a very high attrition rate so you've got to be a survivor first and foremost this great gaggle of cars coming onto the pit straight Harry Perkins moves over in front of Crompton. Mark Larkham just going at a shot there. It's Craig Baird in the Team Brock machine. Mark, Mark Larkham, sorry, Marco, is in 17th position. Had a hell of a year last year. His motto for 2002 is back in the game as Neil Crompton gets inside Russell, Larry Perkins rather, and puts the double zero forward. And also, Craig Baird makes a move on Larry Perkins. So the Castrol Commodore Racing Team is definitely behind on race speed. Jason Bright, Mark Scape, Garth Tander, Craig Lowndes, Marcus Ambrose. That's your top five. And Greg Murphy, Russell Ingle. He's back to seventh now. Stephen Richards, Stephen Johnson, Tony Longhurst. Interesting. Max Wilson has gone to 16th place. So he's sliding back through the field. Not quite sure what the problem is there. Craig Lowndes finally into the pits. Came in in third place on track. Of course, he'll fall further down the list now. Bright and Skate, the Holden Racing Team cars, are dominating this event as they have done for the past three years. Interesting, they brought Craig Lowndes in. Ten laps behind the Holden Racing Team fuel stop. I'm sure that's a result of perhaps the Falcon being thirsty in the Commodore. Well, the Ford teams claim that it does use more fuel than the Chevrolet engine. And maybe as a result, they're... Uh, playing a different strategy there but the trouble is that if there is a sprint toward the end of the race he's going to be carrying more fuel than some other cars so interesting to see whether this plays out for the Gibson Motorsport team here's Paul Morris the Cirame Wines entry see the team working feverishly on the car there tipping in all the fuel also refilling the driver's drink bottle you saw that around the front of the car and a bit of a check underneath as well maybe Paul's complaining of some funny in the hand oh John, John Faulkner, Faulkner. Dynapack racer trying to 
excruciatingly get himself out of there. He has gone in hard. Look at the back wheel spinning as he tries to bring it back out. That looks exactly like the lounge situation at Mount Panorama last year. Remember, he dug it into those tyre walls so hard that it just absolutely wrapped around the car and he couldn't reverse out. Not to mention an almighty shunt he had at the GMC 400 in Canberra. Poor old John Faulkner ended up in the medical tent for some time. And uh, next to uh, Rodhoff, his car just about, that car is in a precarious position. So yeah. that is down at turn 11. Well, it's in between turn 10 and 11 on the forward corner. Well, what's going to be interesting here is to see whether the, any of these teams take advantage if we get a safety car out. Safety car is out, so it's going to be interesting to see whether any of these guys take advantage for a, a tyre change, whether they consider it too early or too late. There's a lot of strategy to be played out here. They're pioneering the use of these tyres. Jason Bargwana, car 35, the second of the Valvoline Cummins cars, coming in for its stop. Yeah, look, um, well, one of the HRT cars are coming in. As far as I know, it's scaping. They were saying that it's uh, scape coming in now, so uh, they are going to take advantage of the uh, safety car. It's going to take a bit of time to get Faulkner's, uh, Faulkner's car out of the tyres, because as you said, it's um, pretty well stuck in there, isn't it? Absolutely. Now. It is flat out down here in pit lane at the moment. Just about every car seems to be coming in or has come in. Greg Murphy's been in for tyres. Todd Kelly's just come through as well. I can see that Jason Bright has made his way in now. One person that's had to come through twice in the space of only a couple of laps. Max Wilson, a drive-through penalty for curb hopping. It's amazing. You're right, Rusty. It's frantic. Garth Tander has just pitted. They put four tyres in and the throwing his old tyres back in the garage and the wheel out another set for Barg, so this team really on the boil. All sorts of action going on in pit lane at the moment. This is where races throughout the V8 Supercar Championship can be won and lost. It's all about slick work down there. Car number two, car number 17 out. Exactly the halfway mark of the Clipsal 500 Saturday race one. It's only race one and Garth Tanner leads him out. Todd Kelly is behind him through the first. Senna chicane, Max Wilson's in there as well. The Surimei Wines entry of Paul Morris gets through cleanly. Curb hopping is a major issue. They don't want it to do it. Up on the inside, Jason Bright makes his move into turn four already. Up the incline, the bumpy part of the track. Now onto the zigzag, the left, the right. Then they can let the legs stretch and push it down Bartels Road once they get around this right-hander. This is a funny-looking restart. Man, I've got to say, I mean, on the timing screen, they're showing the H. Oh, a bit of a contact there between Wilson and Seaton. Paul Morris takes avoiding action. The Haviland Ford's up there too. But that was a very strange restart. On the timing monitor, we're showing Jason Bright in first, Mark Scape in second. They started with three cars in front of those two. I'm not quite sure what's going on here. And three cars from way down the pack, uh, back of the pack as Neil Crompton is out of his car. Neil Crompton gone out of the double zero motorsport Ford Falcon. You can see him looking for a hole in the fence and he takes it. It's a long walk back to the garage for Neil Crompton. And a sorry end to race one of the Clipsal 500. On the lap 40 we go, you're on board. As we take a look out the, uh, the front end and we take a look at Marcus Ambrose trying to cut his way through the field. David Bernard just steps out of the way there. But it's interesting, I'm just trying to sort out if you're a little bit confused at home, so are we here, because our timing monitor is showing the positions as bright first, scape second. But this restart looks like a bit of a mishmash. We'll try and sort that out for you. We're going to go off the timing monitor as it's giving us the information. At the moment, it's showing HRT 1-2. Murphy in third, still to make his third compulsory stop. That's Todd Kelly, the winner of the last round. He's sandwiched in between Garth Tander and the HRT car of Jason Bright. Here's Stephen Johnson and Max Wilson getting into trouble with the Ford Credit Racer of Glenn Seaton. Paul Morris managed to get out to the left-hand side of the track and avoid all that trouble. And there's Todd Kelly. He won the last round of 2001 at Sandown. A spectacular second half of the season for the Kmart Racing Team. No doubt they were the form team of the second half of the season. Kelly finished sixth overall. The highest place rookie for 2001. Tanda is a lap down in this. This is a hell of a scrap up the front. Scape and Bright are leading the way. We understand that Garth Tanda is a lap down, so he's the man sandwiched in between the two HRT Commodores. He's in the Valvoline Cummings Commodore in car number 34. He is a lap down, so your race leader at the moment is Jason Bright and Mark Scape. 
and then Greg oh. Murphy. Oh, four cars, five cars involved in a tangle. That's at turn nine, and Stephen Richards goes off road <laughs> to get out of the mess. They've all got going. It's unbelievable. Well, Jason Barguana was in there, Paul Romano, Bradley Jones, and the uh, Team Kiwi car of Jason Richards, and they've all managed to get going and restart the fight. It was though it never really happened. Take a look at this. They're coming at the end uh, of Decatterville Terrace. The Castro Perkins Commodore is the first one to go. So Steve locked up his rear brakes. Waited off. for the mess to happen. Anthony Tratt tried to find a little hole through, and he got through it as well. Tony Longhurst is caught up in there as well. And then Stephen Richards gets up on the grass to get around the trouble. Well. Wow. They were lucky to get away with that. Let's look at this from another angle. See Barguana. And Longhurst got through, but Max Wilson didn't crunch the better electrical car. And Brad Jones caught up. Anthony Tratt threads the needle. He gets through. Ambrose <laughs> was not involved with that. Larkham got up the inside. Now, here are our true race leaders, folks. And they a new lap record from Mark Skay for 123.72 from the four-time series champion. The HRT cars have been on the pace from the word go. They're setting the pace and the records. Here's Jason Bright, your race leader of the Clipsal 500. He's got Mark Scaife right behind him doing virtually identical lap times. 1.5 seconds, the gap between Bright and Scaife. So the reigning champ has a real battle on his hands. Look at the PlayStation 2 race score. Those green blocks at the end of the name, that shows they've made both their compulsory stops. And you can see right up at the pointy end of the field, most people got those out of the way. This is a great view on board the Kmart racer of Greg Murphy. Just almost as though you're sitting in the back seat of this V8 supercar. And as he takes you through this part of the circuit, it'll give you an idea of just how tough it is for the driver as he changes gear, fights the thing the whole way. This is a bumpy part of the track up Wakefield, then into the right-hander. That's the one that Murph was talking about on our inside line. It catches quite a few people out. Here they go again, the right-hander onto Bartels Road. In front of him is a freight train of cars led by Marcus Ambrose, Mark Scaife, then Jason Wright leading off the field. Watch this for pace. Sixth gear through the Dunlop sweeper. Right-hand side on the right wall, then across to the left-hand side of the track. It's an amazing corner all the way back to second and first gear for this turn nine. Well, Stephen Johnson's still out there in the Shell Falcon in the top 20. He's up in the 13th spot, but we saw the other Shell 18 Ford go out very early on in the race. Paul Radisic joins us. Paul, I think I can encapsulate it. This is not your weekend. <laughs> Pretty much sums it up, Mark, and uh, good afternoon to you too. <laughs> yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's a shocker. It um, started when I uh, hit the wall yesterday in practice, and uh, it's uh, sort of continued on. Just had a, a major water leak and uh, dumped all its fluids, and uh, it was better just to shut the engine down and, uh, and walk back. Paul, if I could put it this way, there's probably only one person in the world who is glad you did what you did yesterday, and that's me, because I was meant to be in your hot lap yesterday <laughs> afternoon. And uh, uh, judging by the way that you hit the wall, I pretty much would have been on that side, wouldn't I? I wouldn't have been sitting on your lap throughout that hot lap. But You, would, uh, you wouldn't have gone that hot with Maddie in the car, <laughs> which is surely... 240 k's, that's what they're telling us that you went in there. I mean, that, that is really big-time impact. It was, uh, it's, yeah, it was a big hit, and, uh, you know, everything was fine right up until... Uh, we got halfway through the corner and just the car picked up more and more understeer and I glanced the wall fairly hard and then sliding down the wall on the back straight there's a where the track opens up and in the end the car went straight into the wall there and fired across on the other side so two impacts and of course um, you know I feel sorry for the guys because they've worked all night. So the mechanics keeping him posted. So if we let them go and they get past Johnson we'll just work on getting Johnson. That's the next aim. Oil on the sweeper, we're told, the Dunlop sweeper. That's what they'll try to tell Marcus Ambrose. So now the aim is catch Stephen Johnson and get past him. Craig Lowndes on the inside of Todd Kelly. Well, he's in this battle. Lowndes is fighting for fifth place, so he's trying to pick his way through these cars as well. He's looking well positioned in the double zero motorsport Ford. So he's being held up by these slower cars too. They won't want to keep that up. Oh, oh Stephen, Stephen Ellery. Ellery. Can you believe it? He was running in the top 10. Look at that. We've got a car on the right. We've got a car on the left and heaps of oil in between. That was from Max Wilson's car, no doubt about it. Whoa. Look at Stephen Ellery into the wall. Well, he hit that oil and he paid the price. Look at the damage there. Max Wilson oh, dear. He's just laid a rainbow right down the side I, of the road. Safety car is coming onto the track. I tell you what, Paul Radisic is sitting alongside us. That was almost a carbon copy of what yeah. happened to you. What a know. rotten bit of luck. Well, look, look where he ended up, too. He comes through that Dunlop sweeper, and this is the thing that got us about your incident uh, a couple of days ago, Paul. 
you go in, I mean, you're stopping all the way down the end of that straight. That's the kind of pace that you're putting through there. So Max Wilson's oil slick that he's left behind leaves a trail of disaster behind it. And the five foot four Brazilian is out of the cockpit, walking around with a slight limp. Let's have a look at this at race speed. This is Stephen Ellery getting out of the oil and Cal oh, how nasty. How long has it taken to stop? It's just the biggest paint scraper right down the wall, a couple of hundred metres at least. And Stephen Ellery will be shattered. There's Max Wilson out of the better electrical car. But boy, oh boy, what a moment. It's uh, th the frustrating thing for these guys down here is that they were saying they lost their telemetry around 30 laps ago. So they've had no feedback to the garage on what's been going on with Max's car. And they just said then the obvious thing is it's just done an engine and the day we need the telemetry. That was the big concern about that Dunlop sweeper, wasn't it? If uh, somebody gets tangled up in there and you're behind him, there's a hell of a lot of trouble to follow. Anyway, safety car peels off. We're back to racing. Plenty more controversy to come in this one as they fire out onto <laughs> the pit straight to restart the Clipsal 500. And boy, have we got a battle on our hands, folks. Look at this. Holden Racing Team 1-2. And Garth Tander, who's supposed to be in third place now. Marcus Ambrose in fourth, Greg Murphy, Craig Lowndes. Here come the pack. Everybody gets through cleanly through turns one and two. They're not meant to take that curb on on the left-hand side of the screen too hard. Now, up Wakefield Street into the right hand, and Rodney Forbes gets squeezed on the outside. Craig Lowndes, his teammate, is right behind him. Somebody's gone right off the edge of the track. Wow, that looked like Anthony Tratt maybe in the toll racing car on board with Marcus Ambrose as he's behind Stephen Johnson. Up around toward Bartels Road for the first time. Marcus Ambrose, he's pretty hot about this situation. And there's been a lot of traffic, as Matt said, going up and down those stairs to the stewards' rooms today. There'll be plenty more after this race. You can count on that. Green flag conditions as they come around to complete the first lap down to Kenneville Terrace. You can see the cement dust that's been laid all oh, over that oil Bright stack. locks it up, coming into turn nine, and yeah. Scaife almost snuck up on the inside, but Bright holds his position. So Jason Bright still leads it, and Mark Scaife is right behind him now. There's Marcus Ambrose putting in the charge. Behind him, the Kmart racer of Greg Murphy, then Johnson. Then it's the double zero Falcons. So two and one, that's Bright and Scaife, 34's Tander. Then you've got Ambrose, there's Johnson. The main, main straight for the first time. Racing team scooting away. Check this as they come across the start finish line. Right, Scaife, Tanda, Ambrose, Murphy. Oh, Lowndes, Longhurst. Look at Bright, he's under pressure now from his teammate. Sliding one way or the other. Saw him step a wheel out on that cement dust. It almost caught him at the hairpin. Now, Mark Scaife starting to apply the thumb screws to his teammate. We started this race with 36 competitors at the moment. We've only got 23 left. 13 have fallen by the wayside. And out, all the time out the front, it's been either one and two or two and one. Jason Bright and Mark Scaife have had a stranglehold on the Clipsal 500 since the word go. Look at the queue here. This is the fight for third. Looking at the rear of the Pertec Ford of Marcus Ambrose and at the front of the Kmart racer of Greg Murphy. The race line has changed a little after all the oil on the left-hand side of the track. Garth Tander moves over to cover his line as they break hard for the hairpin. The oil flags are still out to warn the cars. Oh, Glenn oh, Seaton! No. Glenn Seaton has bit the bullet up on that turn. That's turn four as he's gone into the wall. And quite a few cars have come unstuck there. Can they get him going, though? That's the question. They can't move. Oh, oh problems here. Jason Bargwana! He could have been involved in that Seaton, uh, that, uh, Seaton incident further back on turn four. He's managed to get it all the way down to Bartels and to Ketterville. So he's got about four or five turns left. There's definite front right damage to the Valvoline Cummins Commodore. <laughs> well, amongst all this, we've been trying to have a chat with our world champ, Wayne Gardner. Wayne, we might squeeze it in now while we've got an opportunity. Uh, <laughs> Ron, there's plenty of action there, Mark. Sorry. <laughs> Rotten way to go out of the race, though. Yeah, it's, uh, it was a terrible uh, way, and I'm taking my first race back with V8s, and, um, but look, you know, it wasn't my fault, it was pretty obvious what happened, everyone was spinning off, and unfortunately I got caught up in um, Paul Radice's, uh, you know, uh, coolant in cool, front, yeah. and basically it's like oil, and as soon as I went into it, it just spun around, and unfortunately Wills was trying to come back on the track at the same time, and uh, I clouded him, uh, it was totally out of my hands, it was just, I guess, unlucky. Bargwan is in there getting hurried repairs by the crew, Greg Rust is on the spot. Pretty hot conditions down here too, Mark. You can see the guys, they put their hand underneath the guard trying to 
pull it out a bit, but uh, obviously with that tyre rubbing on, it's generated plenty of heat through it. Now they've got the dent puller on it as well. Barg's losing a lot of time. A bit further down pit lane, Brad Jones is in. They're working on the rear of that car, so not a good day for the Aussie male team either. Well, hopefully they can get that car fixed here. There's the Aussie male forward, the second one to fall. It's a rotten day for this crew. First time they're running two cars. Wayne, just about your car. Um, oh, Murphy's just got in front of Marcus Ambrose there. You can see that shot. So there's a real battle on here for the lead. Just before uh, we let you go, is the car going to be repaired for the race tomorrow? We hope so. Uh, they're having a look at it now, but there is quite a bit of damage, unfortunately, to the back of it. Um, but yeah, they're working away. I'd say more than likely we'll be out there tomorrow. I'd be disappointed if I can't. I really want to be out there. I want to be out there, you know, with the guys and racing. And, you know, as much as I like you, Mark, I'd rather be out there rather than sitting next to you. <laughs> yeah, the feeling's mutual. <laughs> <laughs> All right, mate, thanks for, thanks for your time up here. Best of luck tomorrow. No worries, thank you very much. Wayne Gardner joining us in the commentary box. Look at this battle, though. Garth Tander under a lot of pressure. This is how Greg Murphy found his way past. So it's been a real battle off the lead. Another and replay this looks here. as though the uh, replay incident of the Glenn Seaton tangle with Jason Barguana. Barguana oh. cuts across it. Seaton. Oh. Oh. Information is that Seaton had a jam throttle. I mean, you look at that incident, it certainly looks like it. He had no control. Ooh, Marcus Ambrose got a little bit sideways coming into the sweeper there. At the moment, Jason Bright, Mark Scaife, Garth Tander. Then oh, Greg Murphy and Marcus Ambrose. No, Can Scaife get his teammate? There's, there's trouble here. out the back of the Bright Commodore. Scaife takes the lead in the Clipsal 500. And Jason no. Bright's rear wheel is loose. I reckon he's broken his whole back oh. suspension there. The whole axle is moving from one side of the car to the other. Look at this. The defending Adelaide champion looks as though he's hit the wall. He has in the sweeper. So trouble for Jason Bright. Well, we, we saw a situation when the Watts link... Oh, look at that collision there between Tander as well. Oh, that's exactly what they were trying to tell him. He was trying to tell him to come in. Now he's got to try and limp a whole lap around. He's missed the pit entry. He's got 3.2 kilometres of racetrack now to try and limp his way around. Look and at that still... number two car. It's all over the shop. And look at the rear wheel. The rear right wheel is in big trouble. Looks as though it's going to fly off at any second. Craig Lowndes goes around him. What's happening here is the whole axle is moving left and right under the car. The Watts link that locates the, the axle left actually has broken and the whole axle is moving left to right. It's not a wheel coming off, it's the whole oh, rear axle assembly. Down, and if that comes off, he is going to be stranded out there. Look at it. It could break any second. He could be stranded out there on the circuit. And the rest of the field has started to pounce. They're going past Jason Bright as if he's standing still. Remember, he took the lead from the very first turn. He started in position two, shot past his teammate. That was almost two hours ago. Now an hour and 57 down the track. Jason Bright is limping along with smoke pouring out of the back of the HRT Commodore and cars lining up to pass him. It's just amazing when you see the dominance they've shown early in the race. And for that to happen, under enormous pressure from his teammate Mark Scaife, look at the way he's oh. battling this car, the axle going left, right, left, right. There wouldn't be much holding that thing in now. And the tyres rubbing on the insides of the wheel. And Archers. troubles too for David Benan in the, in the, in the Caltex Haveline Ford Falcon. Just, um, finish park at three. Uh, trouble well. galore from the restart, and at the moment it is Scaife, Tander, then Murphy. Bright is in a whole world of trouble. Scrutineers have called him in. That's Jeff Grek on the radio. Once he's in, he's in. That is kaput. So one Holden Racing Team Commodore out. So he's going to limp all the way down pit lane. Oh, what a disappointment for this crew. Jason Bright's been in scintillating form throughout the week. Showed a great amount of speed in race trim as well. You can see your PlayStation 2 race score at the moment has Scaife, then Tander and Murphy, Ambrose, Lounge and Longhurst. Stephen Richards in seventh. Bright is out. Well, you can see the front headlights from Garth Tander's car stuck. Now, here's the incident. Crush! Oh. Just hit that wall pretty hard when he came out of the sweeper. Look at that axle. Left, right, left, right. He was very lucky to maintain control. Mark Scaife right up behind him would have seen that and took advantage as soon as they came out of this turn. Good car control by Jason Bright to keep that thing under control at such high speed. Bright is not alone in having that same sort of dilemma, Mark, in that uh, that oil put down, unfortunately, by Max Wilson's car. The Aussie male crew have brought Brad Jones in an almost identical dilemma. They have a, a broken rear axle. They're hoping to try and sort of maybe get the car to a stage where they can limp it around and do one lap to classify themselves as finishers in this first leg of the Clipsal 500. Well, laps almost oh, over. 
down with the Stone Brothers and unfortunately David Bernard, he's had obviously those temperatures during the day running high and low and then uh, about a lap ago I was in the pits and the boy said keep it going David, there was an oil pressure light flickering and then the engine just blew so not a good day for them. Yep, the walking wounded, As you can see up in the lap counter at the top of your screen, lap 75 of 78, time running out. Mark Scape, who sat in the shadow of Jason Bright throughout this race, capitalising on that situation. And now he finds himself in the lead of the Clipsville 500. Joining us in commentary, Cameron McConville. Cam, long way to come from Sydney for the Adelaide 500. I know it was an exciting time, beginning of the season, with new sponsors coming on board, but it hasn't been your day. No, you're right there, Mark. We've had an absolute shocker. Speaking of engines let go, we had a, uh, a rocker let go in the engine, so I stopped uh, just up here where you see on the screen now. The uh, engine cut out altogether after it dropped the cylinder. So we've had a shocker, but it's been an entertaining race so far. <laughs> sure. Never <laughs> fails to turn it on in the streets of Adelaide. Lap 76 of 78, and if you think about it, HRT were going 1-2 throughout the entire race since, uh, since we started this thing, so they were looking at 200 points for their first driver and 160 for their second. Now it looks as though only one driver will get the points, but at least at the moment that looks as though it's going to be 200 to Mark Scaife. Cameron McConville, I think you'd have to say that Mark Scaife, even though it was quite fortuitous the way things worked out for him in this race, he's had some real competition on his hands now for 2002 with his teammate. Oh, look, uh, Jason Bright's really stepped up to the mark. He, you know, this year you look at the Grand Prix, he had some really good pace there. Every session he's uh, he's been very quick. He struggled a little bit last year in practice getting his car set up. Uh, just observing when we were in, in practice, sometimes he was behind us and then he'd come out for qualifying and get on top of it. But I think uh, so far this year he's getting to the track, getting the car sorted uh, more efficiently and that's part of the challenge with V8 supercars, getting the car right for qualifying. He was saying this new tyre has almost fallen in his lap in his wake because he's always liked a, a stiffer chassis set up to the one Scaife ran and they found that Jason's setup is actually better for this new Dunlop tyre. Well that's right and I think that'll change circuit to circuit as your setup always does but certainly at the Grand Prix I believe that uh, Bright's car was quite stiff and, uh, and it seemed to be working for him here this weekend so I mean look it's really going to be anyone's championship this year there's no doubt about that. How good is it to see Garth Tander and the Valvoline boys back competitive again? They had a shocker last year, but they've had a bit of a team restructure, and it sounds, feels like they're getting a handle on the car. Well, Garth would be wrapped. I mean, he's uh, got some great car speed, and uh, he was leading early on there, I noticed, when I was sitting on the sideline, so he's going really well. It's a battle a little bit further back in the pack. Yeah, Larry Perkins in position number 11 in car number 11. He's got Craig Baird on his hammer and Rodney Forbes still holding on to a top 15 position. He's currently in third. That's him in car number 7. So there you go, you've got Perkins, then Baird, then Rodney Forbes, and also John Bow has managed to sneak in there as well. So around we go now for the final lap, and Mark Scaife is leading the way. Yeah, well, we're sitting in the shadow of uh, Jason Bright throughout that race, and just as a result of Jason overstepping the mark on that oil, he opened the door, and Scaife will get a maximum points with the ball here. 200 points from the opening race of the season, and this is what we've seen in the last few years. This is why HRT go on and win so many championships. They seem to get a big points haul really early in the season. And especially when it counts on these kind of races. On board with Marcus Ambrose. He looks as though he's in for a top five finish. Currently in fourth position. In front of him is Greg Murphy. So Ambrose over the back of Greg Murphy on the final lap. In front of them is Garth Tander, but leading them out and leading them to the chequered flag at the Clipsal 500. He had four round wins last season. Nine race wins pure domination from the four-time series champion and he'll finish this one off he pre-qualified first he qualified first he had pole position and 200 championship points and a race one victory to start the season for Mark Scaife look at Garth Tander the Valvoline Cummins crew will be elated with that they've had a shocking season in 2001 but that car is really starting to work for them Garth Tander will be delighted to be back and competitive Greg Murphy in third Marcus Ambrose got fourth Craig Lowndes rounded out the top five. And keep in mind, the finishing positions for today determine their grid positions for tomorrow. So we should have a really hot contest. Another 250 k's to go. Can you believe it? And another race victory for Mark Scape. The 48th of his V8 career. What an incredible performance. He held on. He was there at the finish. He said to me a few days ago, this, lap, this race is about being there for the last 20 laps. You can pretty much give up on the first 58 just as long as you're in the hunt. 
But you've got to be there for the last 20 because things will happen. Safety cars will come out. People will drop oil all over the place. Thumbs up for Mark Scaife. 200 points. Garth Tander pulls up alongside in the Valvoline Cummings Commodore. So it's a Holden 1, 2, 3. Let's take a look at how they finish race 1. 78 enthralling, exhausting laps. And Mark Scaife is our race winner. Garth Tander in second position. Greg Murphy gets on the podium. He's in third. Then it's Marcus Ambrose and Craig Lowndes in the Fords. Stephen Richards in sixth position. Tony Longhurst seventh. In eighth was Stephen Johnson, Kelly, Barguana and Perkett. We'll take a break and be back after this.